thanks. I think Terence is a hard act to follow. Um, but I'm also glad that he went first because I think, you know, many of the South Africans in the room will know uh, that in the last, last probably 30 years or so, um, a big part of the policy imagination in South Africa has drawn a lot from Malaysia. Um, so I think that's the first comment I want to make before I start. I think the second comment is a lot of what I'm going to talk about today happens in a context where the credibility of broad-based black economic empowerment as a form of affirmative action I think is under serious threat in South Africa across the racial divide. Um, and a big part of this has to do, I guess, with um, the formation and the creation of new elites. Um, and what I want to talk about today, which in the paper I call the Delangogbwana phenomenon, is really an outcome, as some people suggest, from below, that really, I guess, is a characterization of how disaffected many groups have become with BEE in the formal sense. So, maybe just before I start, just the outline of, uh, I guess, what, what some of the things I want to talk about. Firstly, the framing of broad-based black economic empowerment as an economic rent. Um, not a very po popular formulation in South Africa, but um, quite an interesting one coming from uh, a gentleman who's going to be addressing us tonight, Darren Asamoglu. Um, and this idea of the redistribution of opportunity and redress uh, of centuries of systemic ethno-national harm. The role then, of course, of capital spending. Um, so a lot of the analysis historically of broad-based black economic empowerment is largely focused on the share of black people on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange or in the sort of exchange or the sphere of exchange rather than the sphere of production. Um, uh, and so, in a sense, the study was really trying to focus in the built environment on new construction works and the contestations around rents associated with that. Um, and then also, I guess, the Delangogbona phenomenon as an informal interpretation of rules, laws, frameworks, and institutions around broad-based black economic empowerment and the implications of disruption of uh, planned capital spending. Um, and then also some theoretical stuff around what effectively drives this as a violent tactic of entry. And this is not really unique. Um, a very interesting sociological work done in places like Nigeria looks at this idea of violence as political entrepreneurship. And this might be actual violence or even the perceptive threat or the capacity of violence among certain groups. Uh, and we see a lot of this in the Niger Delta where you know, this leads to the recasting and the reframing of who is in the orbit of rents and who can access rents. And then lastly, some reflections just on policy design and what we can do um, in reforming how the state thinks about procurement and supply chain. So how did, how did I go about this? Well, a combination of methods, primary data gathering, did some interviews, some uh, people, yeah, some people wanted to be anonymous. Uh, and I must say some of them, now that I think about it in hindsight, were very dangerous people. And I'm glad that um, a lot of the discussions did not happen in person. Um, and then, of course, also secondary data analysis, looking at uh, some of the numbers coming through from Stats SA, uh, municipal financial uh, census, um, uh, capital spending uh, um, uh, uh, surveys, media reports, and then, of course, some analysis of the contractor database of one of the industry bodies um, in the construction space in South Africa, which is the Construction Industry Development Board, the CIDB. And then, of course, also analysis of some of the policy frameworks, in particular, the Triple BEE Act, preferential procurement regulations of 2017, which um, was subject earlier on this year to a constitutional court challenge. Uh, and I say quite a bit about that in the paper. And then also the National Infrastructure Plan, uh, largely because I guess a big part of the focus thematically of the paper is around construction and the built environment. Um, and I use a combination of tools from new institutional economics, political sociology, and heterodox political economy to try and understand the drivers of what effectively has become a conflict. A conflict that is disrupting billions of rands in projects in the public and in the private sector. It's called the construction mafia in South Africa. I'm not too happy with that formulation of a mafia because I do think uh, there's a diverse shade of things that are being done and maybe what is only common is the um, tactics of work stoppages, disruption and so on. But uh, very, very different depending on where it is that you are. Okay, so, I mean, I'm not going to go through all of this in a lot of detail, but really this is just the theory around economic rents in the literature. And I think it's quite clear depending on which type of literature you look at that rents are seen in different ways. Often when we talk about rent seeking and a lot of 
the sessions in this conference, you know, um, quite disparaging, I guess, of this idea of economic rents in general. Um, and uh, also interesting that a lot of the discussions that would follow the sessions would always say, yeah, maybe we need a political economy approach. Um, and part of the difficulty of a political economy approach is that, you know, there has to be some assessment of the value judgments we're making about certain economic phenomena. Um, and it's never always, hey, that's good or that's bad, or, you know, there are saints and there are sinners, uh, but effectively is about context and how that matters. Um, and I take a, a framework that says, well, not all economic rents are bad. There are actually forms of productive and developmental rents uh, that, yes, might be a subversion of the price mechanism as an allocator of resources, uh, but effectively are aimed in a transitional society in achieving particular outcomes. I also look at them, economic rents in the South African context, and do a bit of a historic analysis, even predating the Union of South Africa in 1910, um, and then also bring it forward to the Triple B Act and the extraction of rents, uh, which was a key feature of settler colonialism and apartheid in South Africa. Um, where effectively rents were extracted via regressive taxation, via color bar legislation and other mechanisms, effectively to guarantee the social reproduction of the white population in the country. Um, and so, in effect, you know, that's some of the stuff that I talk through. Uh, but I think South Africa also is an atypical example of what, um, you know, and I think this, this discourse has become quite popular in the US of late, drawing on the work of Cedric Robinson and others. Um, this idea of a racial capitalist society, right, where racism is a central feature of how capitalism takes root. Um, and in many ways, you know, this is, draws on the work of Bernard Makubane, who speaks about this long before Cedric Robinson in his work. Um, but also, BE then is a response to this received or inherited framework of racial capitalism and is about subverting it in a very meaningful way. It's about promoting economic unity in the society, protecting a common market, protect, promoting equal opportunity and equal access, uh, but also ensuring that there's a spread in access and control of productive assets among those who historically did not have access to that. So it's important to frame this because I think before we even get to what elements of BEE there are, to understand that BEE actually is an economic rent. Um, and the idea is, the focus has to be on equity ownership, yes, which has been a big part of the literature and the focus and what a lot of people are disaffected by. But also it has to be about enterprise and supplier development. Uh, and a critical part of that is preferential procurement, which is at the center of the, of the, of the paper. Management control, skills development, and socioeconomic development. Now preferential procurement is a distinct element, I guess, to, to this first part here which is equity ownership. In a sense, it's about providing for categories of preference to designated groups, and we'll, I'll come quickly to what those designated groups might potentially be, in the allocation of contracts, and of course, assisting them to, to be protected and to advance the interests of these categories of persons. Now, the expectation in the procurement sense is that this is in the public sector. But increasingly, for private firms, who need certain things from the state. It might be licenses, it might be you know, um, regulation, uh, it might be you know, subsidies, concessional finance, and so on. There is an explicit expectation that they comply with the Triple BE Act. And in particular, the elements around enterprise and supply development. Now, as you can see here, this is drawn from section nine of the preferential procurement regulations of 2017. Now, you can see here, uh, this idea of subcontracting is what, in a way, sets the stage for what I call the Telangogbwana phenomenon. It's distinct from me getting a minority equity stake in an existing business, but this one is about saying any new project that happens that is above 30 million, and in some cases, as the Office of the Chief Procurement Office in the National Treasury says, not only those that are above 30 million, but any project where feasible has to ensure that there's subcontracting to advance some of these designated groups. And you can see these groups there. It's um, what are called emerging micro-enterprises, so that's the EME, and then a qualifying small enterprises, and those are defined by turnover thresholds. Um, and effectively, the whole idea is around they have to be 51% owned by black people or 51% owned by black people who are youth, who are women, who are people living with disabilities, or and this is the spatial dimension, black people living in rural areas or underdeveloped areas and townships. 
And townships, of course, are peripheral areas in the urban space, um, you know, similar to flavelas or barrios and so on. Now, of course, this is then the basis of um, some of the violence that I'm going to touch on shortly. But I argue that a lot of this violence on sites where people come in, bring AK-47s, disrupt construction sites and so on, occurs because of four related reasons. The one is the relative economic and political payoffs of an environment of lack of consequence of some of this extortionist action. And that's related also to this idea that Douglas North and many others put forward, which is in limited access orders, which are, I guess, many of the um, underdeveloped countries in the world, uh, this idea of a state that doesn't have a secure monopoly on violence um, in the sociological sense um, creates opportunities for contestations around the orbit of rent distribution. So how rents are distributed in whatever framework um, is then open to contestation, reframing, um, and continuous negotiation and conflict. Similarly, the persistence of um, what Peter Eke, a Nigerian um, political uh, scientist, uh, calls uh, the distinction between the civic and the primordial. And I think this is quite interesting in South Africa because, you know, one of the cleavages is not only the racial cleavage in South Africa, but coming as we do from a system of ethno-national forms of indirect rule, this specter of tribalism is also something that is quite big. And I know tribalism is a very lazy term for me to use uh, because the whole notion and idea of a tribe is a colonial imposition. Um, but let's work with it for now because in a way, what this speaks to is this idea of non-capitalist forms of power bases um, that are a distinguishing driver and a feature of how this contestation of rents happens. Uh, and this is why this phenomenon is distinct in Guazulu Natal as compared to maybe how it, it finds expression in Cape Town. And then the last comment, uh, of course, is this issue of economic concentration in particular sectors and the perceptions or even the reality of significant barriers to entry into key product and service markets create some challenges. Um, and all of these seen as a whole influence whether or not informal interpretations of BEE. Now, if I go back here, this is the formal framework, right? But for us to opt for a violent framework is determined by a combination of these four factors. Now, let me maybe start just with the fourth factor around concentration. One of the things uh, I did in the study was to analyze the CIDB uh, contractor database. Um, and to say, if indeed we followed the 30 million obligation to the letter. Now, 30% of a subcontract there is around 9 million, right? But in order for you to access that, you need to have a CIDB grading of a certain level, which introduces a chicken and egg problem. You have to have done construction works that qualify you for at least a value in your work plan of around nine million rand or so. Now, the database then shows us how many contractors actually who are registered with the CIDB, because you have to be registered with CIDB to get a contract. How many of them spatially would be level one contributors? So would be, you know, 51% or more black owned, um, or more, um, and how many of them, especially in selected cities that fall outside of the core uh, of, say, Johannesburg and Cape Town, would actually qualify for this? Now think about it. This has to be somebody, ostensibly, who is CIDB grade on the uh, y-axis there, six and above. And you can already see there that very few in Nelson Mandela Bay and Mangawung in particular um, and those are Bloemfontein and Port Elizabeth, um, would actually qualify for, for that type of work. And this introduces this idea of a spatial distribution of who can potentially benefit, which is an issue I'll come back to a bit later. But also, if you look on the right-hand side, which is a quote that comes from the Competition uh, uh, Commission's concentration report that came out last year, it's also important that we think about in the built environment what type of works we're talking about here. So the graph on the left is a composite of all categories of construction work. So building, civil engineering, um, you know, and some of the other more, um, I guess, accessible, in so far as lower barriers to entry are concerned, categories of uh, construction works. But actually, if we look at this idea of concentration, it's quite clear that in the building category, there's less concentration than in the civil work category. 
Also, the higher value projects are to be found in the civil category. And the awards have been higher over the last few years or so in the civil category than in the building works category. So even if you were to follow triple BE in this case to the letter, you still would not formally derived be able to, you know, to access uh, some of these opportunities. And uh, that last comment there really saying, top five firms in the civil work category, even after, of course, a lot of the deconcentration of the sector, after a scandal, and I'd encourage you to take a look at this, uh, South Africa hosted the 2010 World Cup, uh, and it was later found that a lot of the construction companies who were involved in building the stadia had colluded to fix prices on contract work. And then, you know, a lot of them were forced into something called the Voluntary Rebuilding Program. Um, and they faced some issues because contracts dried up thereafter, and a lot of them effectively, you know, merged. And a lot of the mergers, according to the competition authorities, did not lead to a shift in the market structure in the high value categories of work. Um, so, and I think we see this here, and I think the point I'm trying to make here is that a big part of where we are now with the economic recovery strategy of South Africa is that infrastructure is at the center of it. And so too, if you look at the second bullet there, is this idea of enforcing local procurement rules as a way to transform. But we can also see on figure one here, which is from Status A data, that the big budgets, capital spending wise, are actually sitting in municipalities and state-owned companies. So national and provincial governments really don't have a lot of money by way of big uh, budgets for construction works, which is where the contestations are being fought over. But similarly, if we look at this graph, um, these two graphs here, now the one at the top is looking at all the metros, so you've got Buffalo City municipality here, formerly East London, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Tswane, formerly Pretoria, Ekuruleni, which is probably the industrial center, um, Eteguini, Durban, Mangaung, Bloemfontein, and Nelson Mandela Bay, uh, which is Port Elizabeth, so those are the big metropolitan municipal areas, uh, and this is how much they've spent on new construction works uh, between 2017 and 2020. We can already see around 2020 or so, or 2019 and 2020, massive declines in how much has been spent on new construction works. And similarly, if you look at the SOCs, if we take out ESCOM, um, one of the interesting things is that we haven't seen this phenomenon of Delangokbona in ESCOM. Um, we've seen other forms of mafioso tendencies in ESCOM, but they've been rather distinct from what we've seen here. Um, and it's quite clear that if one looks at the compound annual growth rate of a lot of this between 2015 and 2020 in the SOCs, that a lot of them, um, as the people expected to spend the big money, uh, actually have not been doing so. Some of it is explained by state capture, and some of it, of course, is explained by the weakening um, and, I guess, the gutting out of capabilities inside of the SOCs. So let's take a look at this Delang Ogbona story. So it starts in 2014, business forums and youth groups that's the form organizationally takes, right? And what it, it does, if you look at 2017, it's the start of site invasions. But also the site invasions occur in a way where there's continuous engagement, dialogue, and negotiation with some of these authorities here that are engaging in this work. Primarily Eteguini, which is where a lot of this starts. Of course, later on, there's a rebranding, uh, and I'll say a bit more about that in the next few slides or so. How many more minutes do I have? Two, three? Three, okay. Now, how do they work? Well, the first thing is that, you know, they come on site, uh, as a, a Sandral executive once said, arrives, on a, arrives in a bucky, fires shots in the air, demands their share, burns equipment, pushes workers in front of moving traffic, and really very disruptive. But who is doing this? In many cases, it's a coalition of what I would call the disaffected. So former military veterans of the armed wing, in particular of the governing party, Mkondo Wesizwe, minibus taxi operators, funeral parlor entrepreneurs. Interesting story around the funeral parlor entrepreneurs. Many of them were saying, we don't want uh, South Africans or black people of Indian descent to bury people in many of the black rural areas. So as I said, the cleavage is not only between black and white, but there's also an intranational type of cleavage that is emerging. And of course, there's a political dynamic to it. So if I can quickly go to this slide, um, or maybe let me go to this quote before I go to that slide. The president of Delang Ogbona speaks quite interestingly about the origin story of, of this phenomenon. He says, you know, a lot of them used to be hit men, right? 
uh, armed guns for hire. And they effectively realized that actually the payoffs from criminality um, relative you know, to more formal mechanisms that they could access via state procurement were probably much riskier. And so effectively, they needed a piece to capture the pie of what was coming out uh, of uh, the preferential procurement framework. So this was a response intentionally to state policy. But similarly, what we see here in 2017, if you go back to the timeline I shared earlier, the disruptions start a lot earlier. And in starting, the negotiation also happens. But the negotiation happens alongside disruption and violent disruption. So there isn't a sense that we're violent and then once we brought into the orbit, we stop. But actually, the violence continues even where, as you see here, Sandral signed some of the maintenance contracts with grade one uh, civil engineering companies, which is the lowest grade you can get. Just a last comment, just before I wrap up. I think there is a big element to this that is linked to the fratricide and the disunity inside of the ANC. Uh, and if you look at this particular poster, uh, following the exit of uh, former President Jacob Zuma, if you look at the bottom of the poster, all of these groups that are engaged in this Delangogbona phenomenon are effectively very much a part of the campaign, 100% um, behind Msholozi, which is uh, what Jacob Zuma is called, or hands off, um, and this is the president or the champion of radical economic transformation. Uh, but also it leads, as the last bullet is saying there, to a very, you know, decentralized and quasi-federal interpretation of what is effectively national policies around redistribution. And that presents big question marks around this idea of a unitary state. So what do we do? I think the first issue really is around policy design and execution. Um, and I think a key part of it is around the ambiguity that creates scope and space for these informal adaptations. And what should we ideally be doing? Well, the one is to regularize the business fora, uh, because anybody can set up a business forum tomorrow, um, and effectively that obscures the genuine business people who might be looking for opportunity. The second one is policy needs to define what we understand local to be. The ERRP speaks about local in the sense of the South African sense, but the interpretation of many of these groups is that local means my neighborhood or my ward in Durban. And if Murray comes from Cape Town, he should not be getting my contract. And then I think the third one is really a, confront this issue of the juniorization of supply chain functions. In many of the SOCs and in the municipalities who yield the largest budgets, this is the function that is often given to the most junior people who are the most impressionable, who can be influenced in order to achieve particular outcomes. And then the last comment is that our procurement system acts like we're meeting the market for the first time every single time. And so there's a big need for market intelligence to say who is in this market, what is the composition of the actors in this market, what is the demographic profile of those actors. And unfortunately, a lot of that doesn't happen in many of the organs of state that are procuring. Thank you.